forward to a good weekend. Looking forward to spring coming. So I can't believe it hasn't arrived for you guys yet. It's late, eh? Because for us, we only had it the last two days. Like it's literally come to London. Yeah, no. Like we had like last Saturday was 80, 80 degrees almost, and it was beautiful. Yeah. Um, this week has been like, like in the shitter again. And uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. but we wake up here at like five thirty. Okay, cool. So, you know, the dogs have to go out. That you know, life has to begin. Of course. Um, I'm down here in my pain cave, my bike room, because my my uh, youngest daughter has a delayed opening for school today. So, uh, okay. And my office is next to her bedroom. Uh-huh. So I didn't want to like. Uh, I want her to get as m- much sleep as possible because, uh, cool. you know, a tired teenager is not a good thing. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love. I just love. I really do love, like, as corny as this sounds, I love the optimism in the sunrise. Yeah. Like, it's just like, it's popping, like, for us, it's just, so it's popping up over the, over the city, over New York City, and then it's starting to kiss the Hudson River. Cool. And, like, it's starting to light everything up, and I'm like, all right, new day, yeah. filled with new opportunities, and so I, so I love that. So today, today is actually quite sunny. It's a beautiful morning. It's just... It's just colder than it normally is. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I did that because my wife was about to start leaf blowing. Oh wow! <laughs> so because she's got she's in charge of the international cooking club in our town. Oh wow! And so that they have a they have a big they have 25 women coming today, and so oh wow, that uh, sounds exciting. And so she's trying to clean up the house. <laughs> Classic. And I'm like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like. Don't do the leaf blower now. <laughs> yeah, I was like, hey, I'm going to be downstairs because, you know, I'm trying to keep, like, everything quiet. And she's like, oh. <laughs> uh, awesome. So Thanks, much. guys. It was so Thank great. You. Take care, man. Have Thank a good one, man. Good day. All right, man. Thanks for Have your fun time. storming the Have castle. All Cheers, right. buddy. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Cheers. My brother, man. Woohoo! Ooh, how's it going? Give chat, my man. Really cool chat, eh? What a nice guy, bud. Such a nice guy. Like, um, just, yeah, yeah, really liked it a lot. Yeah, just I liked really, it really a lot nice. as well. Yeah, yeah. He was just like, just such a nice, genuine guy. Like, you know, and told yeah. such a cool story. And I think he so, speaks well, like, just yeah, smooth well. and nice and like, yeah. friendly. And like, friendly, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, it's really like, yeah. it's a nice, that just nice yeah. element. Yeah, very open. I like that too, you know. Oh, um, just such a nice guy. Like you said, like you could just see you could be a friend with the oak like that, you know, like yeah. hang out and just have a good chat about different things on a like, keep it light and yeah. and go a bit deeper and have a cry and you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Gift, you know, like yeah, that, yeah, yeah, know? exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's cool, man. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo. Woo-hoo-hoo. <laughs> <laughs> great guys how's it going my man how's your day bud? yes uh, pretty awesome my man how about yours yeah really really awesome thank you bud um how was your weekend what did you get up to oh, i had a good weekend uh went to a little baby shower and uh but for the blokes so it was basically barbecue and hanging out <laughs> and, beers. and um, yeah exactly and uh, that was about it and uh and some in- enjoyable podcast uh editing and stuff which was great always enjoy that uh, aspect of my weekend having a re-listen to the, some of the chats we've had and uh how about you you've been you've been pretty busy what what how was your weekend yeah mine was really good as well thanks um well, my, my girlfriend was away in uh, in Milan, so I had a lot of uh, free time, and um, I, I'm also busy doing an executive coaching course, actually, and I spent a lot of time on the weekend doing that. Uh, each week, we have, like, different assignments and, um, you know, different uh, topics to cover and things we need to do in our coaching sessions, which has really been so interesting, like, uh, truly understanding what a coach is. And it's really kind of shifted my uh, mindset uh, when it comes to, you know, for having a coach, you know, and what their actual role is. And I really, I've learned so much from this course and I, it's actually almost made me pivot in, in terms of what I want to kind of do going forward besides the podcast. 
Uh, so it's one of those cool realizations, you know, like, and I've really felt uh, that I, I've, first of all, learned so much, but, uh, but like, just when I speak about it, and when I think about it, it's like, I really love that element of it. Uh, so it was, that was basically my weekend was, was doing a lot of homework and, and coaching session prep and speaking to my fellow uh, coaches and clients and stuff. So yeah, it was a cool one. Thanks, bud. Um, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. And that ties in quite nicely with our guest this week, doesn't it? Yeah, for sure. That, that's, that's definitely, um, Michael O'Brien is a coach and executive coach, but most certainly during this chat, there were massively, there were overarching themes of a guy that is just genuinely nice and super friendly. And both of us had sort of a grin on our face the whole way through our chat, just because he's just such a nice guy and, and friendly and you just can't help but just listen in to his stories. And, um, he, he describes himself as sort of the guy that is standing behind you in the grocery store. He's had a suburban sort of upbringing and, uh, he, you know, worked in a printer and, and copier, uh, sale as a printer and copier salesman. And, you know, he just had one of those light, sort of almost something you'd see in the movies where, you know, just the stock standard upbringing. However, he ends up being such an awesome, awesome guy. And, and there's a lot more to his story at the end of the day, but, it's something 98% of your story is something that all of us can relate to. And we've all been there. And that's why there's so much value in this chat that we had with him. Hey? Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, I don't want you to kind of like uh, maybe mislead the, the listeners there, but, but uh, he, he sold fax machines and I know you, you don't want to confuse oh, yeah, yeah. them because <laughs> <laughs> people, don't, people might not know what fax machines are. But uh, yeah, the story that he tells us uh, around that is so cool. And there's so many like great anecdotal stories in there that I just think like people will love and just like enjoy listening to. I certainly did, you know, like you know, just his dreams as a young boy wanting to be a professional sportsman and not necessarily interested in school that much. Uh, but actually when it comes to professional sportsmen as well, what he, what he really wanted to do is he wanted to be a professional temp and bowler, <laughs> which is so cool. And he like had his own personalized balls and t-shirts and and that sort of stuff and i think him and his dad used to play it and they still talk about it to this day so <laughs> that was really really cool and you know he also tells such a cool story about him and his wife and like and how they met you know like it was back in the day it was the the, the version of online dating back then that's how they kind of met you know and <laughs> And the way he goes about sort of describing it and, and telling us the story, you know, he just, he's such a good storyteller, I find. And, and you know, just besides like the way he tells the story, also the, you know, the way his voice is projected. It's just like, it's kind of really endearing and just like you, you, you it's so sweet as well, I guess, if I have to say it that way. But it's just, it was such a nice uh, story that he told us there and, you just want to hear more and you just want to like root for him as a person, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, but you know, like also I think things happen in your life as well, which, uh, which make you sort of shift where you're going. And he had quite a big event in his life that happened to him, uh, which did that, didn't he? Yeah. It's interesting that you were use the word shift and, uh, uh we will come to that, but you know, Michael being an avid cyclist, um, being on the roads a lot, he had obviously put himself out there and yeah, one day, um, as fate would have it, he, uh, had his last bad day as he puts it. And uh, after a serious accident, he totally pivoted, um, his life trajectory. And instead of becoming a victim or having a victim mindset about, this horrific accident that he ended up having, he ended up seriously changing his life and he had renewed strength to become a better person, to help others and support his family even more. 
and really make something of passion uh, in his life or of his life. And he wrote an amazing book, which uh, is called Shift. And uh, he's it's just he, he wrote it for his family and for his for his daughters. And um, however, in doing so, he has actually stimulated himself to become this this coach. And he went in that direction. And now he's helping thousands of other people to to be inspired and become better versions of themselves. So he totally used this horrible scenario for the better. And he's anything but average these days. So I, I think it's a valuable story and a valuable lesson for everybody. And I think it's a good time for us to to take a listen to what makes Michael O'Brien ridiculously human. Well, uh, good morning there, uh, Michael O'Brien from uh, New Jersey. Uh, it's a cold morning for you, from what I understand. You're also downstairs in your in your sort of man cave. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on <laughs> on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Uh, how's your day going so far, bud? So far, so good, guys. So awesome to be with you. Yeah, I'm down in I'm down in my pain cave, as I call it. It's like my bike room. <laughs> where I do my indoor training and you mentioned the weather. Yeah. I've been actually in this pain cave a lot longer than I really desire. I want to get outside and get some vitamin D and some sunshine, but you know, yeah. uh, in time, yeah, this too shall pass. I know this, I know it will become <laughs> spring and summer one day. So. <laughs> oh, cool stuff. And, and so what are you like on your, uh, what, what are they called? The, the wind turn, what are they, uh, the air bikes? What are they called again? Um, I forgot the name. Well, so we, I have basically, uh, oh, they used to call them wind trainers. Yeah. That's uh, like, it. so, but now they're like, now, now this whole world is totally different. They've, they've brought gamification to indoor cycling. So yeah. I'm on something that uses like real gears, but it connects through Bluetooth to a computer called Zwift, wow. Z-W-I-F-T. And so you you'll love, you guys will love it because I, I get to ride the, the world championship course in London. No way. So it's really cool. So yeah, yeah, you get on on this thing and then there's other courses like made up places like um, and then like Richmond, Virginia. And so they've mapped it out through like, you know, GPS and you can race and ride with people all around the world. So we all have our little own avatar with our own little flag from country of origin and we can ride together and race together. I like, so I'm racing through like, you know, London with <sighs> 70 other dudes and dudettes from all around the world. And so when the, ter <laughs> the train changes, the trainer automatically connects with the computer and makes the resistance harder. And so then when we go wow, down like, uh, yes. like, like Box Hill, if we're going down Box Hill in London, then the resistance eases up and we're flying downhill. It's, it's like, and so, and you get points and like, yeah, it's a whole like total gamification to indoor cycling. Oh. And I think, I think back to like how I began like indoor cycling, I had rollers in my moldy basement <laughs> growing up in a home, just looking at the wall, right? There was no TV. I was just looking at the wall. I might've had like a, a radio cause this yeah. was before satellite radio. And now it's like, you get to chat with people, say hi, wow. you, you make friends. It's, it's like, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, you know, yeah, ridiculously human. So, um, <laughs> and it, it, it's actually changed. I think it's changed outdoor cycling a lot because now guys and gals are like, ah, oh, it's a little cold. Um, I'll, you know, screw going outside. I'm just going to go on <laughs> swim and yeah. hang out inside and ride inside because it's much more entertaining now. And so, wow. um, so in the past we would have like maybe 25 guys show up for a cold morning. Now we have like seven because <laughs> everyone's inside. It's, 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 it's crazy. It's a really and, cool and event. So, and like, does it have any kind of like feedback uh, in terms of if you, you're like leaning into it or turning, or is it purely just the resistance on the hills and that kind of thing? So you don't get like the turning thing. Um, yeah. but I, I, I will say like, there's a part of the course that sort of goes down into the, the London tube yeah. and we go downhill and up and around and I get a little like, Ooh, like, wow. like, <laughs> like I get a little like uh, vertigo, like on that. So I tend to look away, but we don't get the curves, but definitely like you get, you get the resistance and, oh, 
and it's 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 yeah it's it's totally wild it's you know it's a membership it's cost like i think ten dollars a month or nineteen dollars a month and yeah radically changed how we do indoor cycling now Wow, that sounds like so much fun, actually. You know, yeah. yes, I'd, I, I almost want to go get one myself now. I'd say. <laughs> it, and so imagine has, virtual reality. How amazing that's going to be! Like you're just going to totally be immersed in that in that place wherever you are in Tour de France on one of the stages and uh, uh, be at home. It's amazing. Jeez, I, it it really is. I I find it to be completely fascinating. Like especially because. I'm old enough to remember how it used to be and how boring and like monotonous it used it, it was. And now it's it's like everything sort of coming at you. And again, there's chats and there's races and wow. points and badges and everything that you would expect out of a, a game. Yeah. And it it brings it all right here. And so I get to, you know, compete against guys like I would normally compete against on a Saturday saturday morning or sunday morning in a group ride and now we're riding together on zwift that's it's, so cool wow. it's it's totally <laughs> it's a little it's it's awesome and it's a little like this is whacked right yeah. so it's like because <laughs> we're we're sort of all siloing ourselves a little bit but yeah. um but you know i also see the the benefit of it because it, it it's changed how we ride in the winter and what happens is now when we come into the spring Guys and gals are in just better shape. Okay, cool. Wow. Yeah. It almost so sounds it's, sounds yeah. like it's potentially one like baby step away from, well, you know, let's all meet his avatars at work and at the mall or whatever, and I'll just stay at home. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I like, think, we're yeah. not too far away from that. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I don't think we really are. It's. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's just it's really cra- it's crazy. So I have it. It's right here, like my little setup. You know, hook my bike to it, all Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and I can be right. in London in a second, riding, riding past you know all the different monuments and through the streets, and it's pretty wow. cool. And and so so do you have like a preference? Like I mean, do you still love outdoors more, or is it you know what 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 do you feel like? So my preference is still to go outside. So for me, like my training translates best when I'm outside. So if I'm doing outside rides where it's really like the ups and downs, the twists and turns, the wind in your face, the wind in your back, that variety really helps my training in terms of like taking my training and put it, putting it into like improving my fitness and improving my ability to race and get faster. Yeah. So Zwift is great to keep, you know, to maintain. But when we do the interesting thing about Zwift races is that when the gun goes off, it's like, you know, sort of balls to the wall sprint. It's like the first five minutes is like completely insane. And then you just start, you've maxed your heart rate out to your like AT. And now it's just like trying to keep it there. And there's not an ebb and flow mm-hmm. to a Zwift race, like a, you know, a race here outside or a training ride. So a training ride, you can get, and you guys know this because of your fitness interest, you can go super hard and go max intensity and go way outside your comfort zone. And then there's a period of rest. So there's like the up and down. And I do better with up and down. Like I can like go past that intensity and recover quickly. Yeah. Zwift is more like a time trial or a mountain bike race where you hit your heart rate high and then you just peg it and it's like that. Okay. So, but yeah, for me, I would, I would much prefer to be outside. You know, I just, I, you know, I like, I like the wind, I like the sun, even when the conditions are sort of crummy, it's just like being out there. It's like, yeah, I'm out here and someone yeah. else is on their couch. But now that's what I used to say. Someone's on their couch and I'm out here. Look how tough I am. <laughs> but now I'm like, well, they're probably on Zwift. Yeah. You know? so, <laughs> so they're probably training and they're probably getting strong too. But yeah, for me, Nothing translates better for me than outside training into my racing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I can and, hear someone sitting at home saying, uh, "Michael's just old school. He likes to be outside." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. They're like, "Yeah, he's an old guy. Yeah. He's like, one of those guys, you know, like uh, he probably rides a bunch of steel bikes." And the answer to that yeah. is yes. Like, all my bikes are basically steel, and uh, you know, totally r- retro, but. Yeah, there's, you know, there's some, hey, I love innovation, 
but there's something about the tried and true that's really appealing. Like you go back to like some of the stuff that we, we once forgot because there was like this new shiny object and we're like, Oh, we got to have that. And it's like, well, you know what? Go back to like how we used to train, you know? So I, I still, I still train that way. Like I don't train with power. I still train with like perceived exertion and stuff like that. And, and really try to listen to my body more than anything else. Yeah. 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 I actually, I, I'm now that I'm thinking back, like uh, my old gym in uh, London, like they have like, I think one of the biggest spin studios in Europe or something like that. And they actually have like these screens, exactly what you're talking about, but like massive ones, almost like a film, you know what I mean? And, and you have like a hundred bikes or however many in the room and they have the, you know, the virtual reality sort of like, you know, you're on the roads and you're going like through and it was so cool. I remember actually now that you say it, I, I remember doing it once. I was like, this is like transforming how people are going to exercise and actually make them want to exercise because it does have that element of almost feeling real, you know? Yeah. And so the, I think that many spin studios are doing that or, the, or at least they're focusing in on the experience beyond just the bike. Yeah. Right. So like soul cycle in New York, they, they brought a whole like woo woo hippy dippy thing and like edge to spinning. And then there's a whole bunch of other spinning studios here in the States that do something. They, they do their own thing. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's all to like bring people back to make it entertaining. Yeah. So people don't get bored with it. Cause if it's just a spin bike and a great soundtrack, it's like, huh? And then Peloton Cycles has figured out how to just keep people at home and bring that experience to their home. So now you don't have to leave. Like you can have a virtual spin class uh, right here in the States and connect with people and uh, great music, you know, enthusiastic instructor. So, yeah, it, it, I think everyone's trying to figure out, like, how do you capture the mind share of someone's brain so they keep on coming back? Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Oh wow, it's so cool. I think we real estate is yeah. yeah so. I, I think we're just living in like the most incredible time right now. Like it's just so exciting with everything that's going on. You know, we literally are shifting into this new era. Um last night I was actually and the night before I went to um a talk by uh this guy called John Sane, who was a previous guest on the podcast, and he was talking about, you know, the the future of technology and this the disruption that's coming. And honestly, like some of the things he was saying, my eyes were almost popping out of my head. Like just I couldn't believe like the actual change that's going on, you know. And 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 I was telling Craig about this earlier on or actually last night on the way home. I was so excited. <laughs> and <laughs> one of the really interesting things was like that fridges are going to become a thing of the past. And the the sales in fridges in in cities like New York and San Francisco has actually almost for the first time started decreasing uh, and that's because of Amazon Prime uh, sorry yeah, Amazon Fre- oh. Amazon Fresh and yeah and then they talk about like basically you're going to have these uh, big blimps that are going to hold tons of stock and basically what they'll do with drones is like they'll you'll order something food or whatever it is and then like within a minute yeah literally within a minute you'll have it at your house dropped off by a drone and there's going to be no need for for fridges or to store stuff anymore it's incredible like and it's like, that's wild it's wild eh? <laughs> it's crazy it's great what well, do we do with that uh, space next to the uh, you know, next to the stove in our kitchens. I mean, yeah, I know. You know. Where are you gonna put? Where are you gonna put your kitchen magnets? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I guess. Uh, you know, that, that certainly there'll be something that fills the room. Probably another screen of some sort. But that that's that's wild. Well, Amazon's doing a good job trying to learn the whole grocery store or supermarket business by buying Whole fo- Foods yeah. in the states. And you yeah. know, they in terms of like a guy who plays the long game. Jeff Bezos is a pro of pros in terms of playing the long game. So yeah. we'll see what happens. Yeah. It's, cra- it's crazy stuff, though. That's it is wild. crazy. Hey, yeah, definitely. Um, so, so yeah, uh, Michael, I just uh, kind of want to give a bit of um, context to the chat in terms of like how we actually know about uh, yourself. So you and I are past alumni of uh, the Alt MBA, which is a course uh, run by uh, Seth Godin. And you know, like you actually finished it the year before me, but then what happens 
you know, like with a lot of other schools, and, and it's quite an American thing, actually, as you become part of um, an alumni group, and um, you're just exposed to kind of all these awesome people that have, you know, been on the same journey as you, and uh, yeah, we just met, I think, pro probably because we had the same interests in terms of uh, podcasts, and uh, were on some calls then, and yeah, it's an absolute pleasure to have you as a as a guest uh, on our podcast um so thanks a lot for joining us um and yeah like you know what uh, we really find that people enjoy is uh, is people's stories you know and uh, that's what the ridiculously human podcast is it's almost like we're documenting people's lives or at least parts of it you know uh, so you know if uh, you know, you're obviously, you know, from America, you, you're born in a um, place called Penfold in, in New York uh, State. And yeah, do you just want to kind of like give us a little rundown about, you know, what childhood was like for you uh, back in the day? And uh, yeah, just kick off from there. Yeah, no, awesome. So no, totally pumped to be with you guys. And I do love the whole fact that the NBA brings so many, many people together. Yeah. It's, I think it's in, incredible. And yeah, so I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm still thrilled with my investment in the all NBA cause it's brought us together. And yeah. I know you have met a whole bunch of cool people and I have, and sort of just spreads the ripple of fact across the planet. So I think yeah. that's, that's wickedly cool. So yeah, I grew up outside of Rochester, New York, a uh, little town, a little suburb called Penfield. And, I um, I, like my upbringing was like pretty like class A suburban. Yeah. Right. So it was, you know, grew up, um, you know, I have sister, two parents, and it was family of four. Had the dog, and I played sports. That was really my big thing. Like yeah. I did not, I was never really confident in school. I re I was retelling the story to someone else. Another all NBA uh, peep, um, another mate. He's uh, from uh, Australia, South Africa, and then now Canada. Uh, cool. And and I was telling him about like I still remember in third grade. So I was about uh, I'd have been like seven years old, and I remember just struggling with reading. And one of my the the teacher, this was purely out of kindness. Basically, had this challenge like how many people could you know how many books can people read all the students. And so you had this like little thermometer, right? And he would uh, color it in after you read a book and you had to get from like zero degrees Fahrenheit to like a hundred degrees Fahrenheit. Right. And so each book you read, you got 10 degrees. And so everyone would be reading books and crossing it off. And he saw that I was struggling. So he was like, well, I'll cross it off when you read a chapter of a book. <laughs> and I remember him doing that like so vividly and I know he was doing it out of like well intentions, right? He was trying to help me, but what he did is he lowered the bar and then he also lowered my confidence. Oh, wow. Right. And it, to me, it became obvious that I was different from every other student yeah. and I was, I was a slower reader okay. than everyone else. And that really sort of, that was like one seed that was planted in terms of like school and my excitement about school. You couple that with like my love of sports. So growing up, it, just by, based on the change of seasons, I was I would dream about I was going to be a, like a pro basketball player, huh. a football player, a baseball player. Baseball was my true love. You know, I was I love cycling there, too. But I didn't really know about European cycling back then because we didn't really have any exposure to it in the States. And I was just like I was going to be I'm going to play for like whatever professional team. Right. And as, as the seasons went, I even thought I was going to become a professional bowler. Right. Because <laughs> growing up in Rochester, New York, where it's all cold, you uh, play hockey. And in the wintertime, you go bowling. And I was like, I'm going to come up, become a professional bowler. And what <laughs> many people don't realize about me, I was actually really good at bowling. Like I had my <laughs> own personalized bowling balls and my own personalized, <laughs> personalized bowling shirts. And like I was totally into it. Um, my dad was a big bowler, so we still talk about it to this day, the pro bowling tour, which I don't think very few, very few <laughs> people actually talk about. Um, but I, that's, that's where I felt the most confident. Like when I was in, when I was playing sports and I wasn't necessarily like all American, but when I was on the field, when I was pitching in baseball or w whatever I was doing, I just felt confident and I felt like 
I was enough. Yeah. In school, I just felt like I was, I was sort of like Mr. 83%. Like I never got A's. Like my <laughs> average was like a C plus to a B minus. So, you know, I would traditionally get 83s out of a hundred on most of my tests, <laughs> but I never got into it. I never fell in love with like the whole like interest in learning. Yeah. And I was just like sports, 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 sports. And it was pretty much a vanilla type of suburban lifestyle. Like nothing really significant happened in our lives. It was just our going through. And, you know, my, my parents are awesome parents and they taught me a lot in terms of like being kind and customer service. My mom was a nurse and my dad was in sales and just like service for people and all that, all that great stuff and just integrity some really great building blocks. Yeah. But I just sort of went through and I didn't necessarily have big visions. You know, a lot of people come on, you know, you meet people and you're like, I had this big vision. This is what I was going to mm. be. Like I had a vision of being a pro sports player, but that was sort of like, that was even bigger than that big, hairy, audacious goal yeah. that Jim Collins writes about and good <laughs> to great. Like my goal was a little ridiculous. Like, you know, <laughs> very few people go pro. And I just was starting, I was just doing what I thought society wanted me to do, like go to school, play like organized sports. Eventually I would go to college, graduate, get a job, marry a girl, get married, have kids and just sort of go along and sort of, but mindlessly go along, right? Without much consciousness. Yeah. And that was a lot of my life. So it was sort of idyllic in a way. It's like, you know, I had, you know, loving parents Things were safe. Um, I went to a good school. I wasn't necessarily a good student. You know, I wasn't a poor student, so I'm not like, you know, I'm not going to be like Gary Vanderchuk and say like, oh, I was getting F's and D's, right? Because <laughs> we love to make our failures even bigger than they are. That's you know, true. like, yeah. Uh, you know, so like, we th that that's very popular today. Is like we want to, you know, basically uh, put some hyperbole on our faults, yeah. right, to become more relatable. But I was like C plus, B minus sort of like <laughs> average. And, and that's how things were rolling uh, for quite some time. And I spent a lot, so I spent a lot of time in comparison. So I spent a lot of time sort of comparing what I had against everybody else. But the output of that was more about judgment of myself yeah. than inspiration that I could like reach that higher level. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I was, you know, so I spent, Rochester was a great, great place to grow up. It's also a great place to leave <laughs> because the winters are really cold and the economy wasn't so great when I was growing up there. So I left um, I left for school, for university, and I went down to Virginia. Okay, cool. And um, but, but you know what? To me, that, that, that sounds like that's what most people are actually like, you know what I mean, when we grow up, you know, like I, mean, I can just hear a lot of what you're saying as in that's my upbringing as well, you know, like... I just love sports as well at school, you know, and I, I liked, I loved school, but I didn't necessarily like studying as well. And I was also pretty like, you know, standard when it came to, to that too. So I think it's a, it's something that like everyone can relate to that sort of story. Yeah. I like, like getting up in front of my classmates for like a book report, like, <laughs> you know, public speaking. Oh, I could not do it. Yeah. Like I, like I would get, I would stutter. I would get all like red in the face. I would be a, I would be a mess. <laughs> so now like, like when I think back, like I did a TEDx talk and I speak now part of my business, I'm like, wow, what a transformation. But back then, and that was all the judgment piece. Like, what are people saying about me? Right. Yeah. And, and, but I think it's very common. You know, if you're, you know, in seventh grade or 10th grade, if you're a teenager, you're worried about these things. You're just trying to survive high school. Of course. And for a lot of my life, that's, you know, I was just wanting to get by because that's what I thought, you know, society wants you to finish high school. So that's what you do, like cross it off your to-do list. But I didn't really have like any burning, like big purpose, right? Yeah. Except like, I know I loved when I was most confident, I was moving. I was playing sports of some sort. And I, that's when I was the most happy. Yeah. In school, I love the camaraderie of school and all that stuff like that. Uh, but like the, the actual like, passion to learn, that didn't that f switch wasn't flipped until later in life. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting how that happens when you you find that thing that just 
it's something that viscerally starts to happen inside of you. It's not something that you can like um, just read or get inspired into necessarily from like assimilation. It's it's something that you just you, there's a spark from within you, and suddenly you're like, I want to learn. I want to get back to the books. I want to something just changes, and that's a a really good place to be. But a lot of people talking about sort of an average upbringing. I think a lot of people talking about your trajectory. People end up, you know, getting to the end of high school, and they go, "Wow, you know, I suppose I should study something, and and uh, I've got to go." And if if you haven't got that big bold plan, right? So, so what was your sort of journey in, into marketing, and and how did you make the transition from and and make the decision to go that direction instead of another direction? Yeah, so great question, Craig. So I would say going into my senior year of high school, I mentioned that one teacher that sort of planted a seed of like you're not enough in terms of a student. What I wanted to do for a senior year of high school was take uh, advanced placement chemistry. And I was good at chemistry my junior year, but I didn't. Ne- I wasn't necessarily the brightest chem student, right? So I wasn't top of my class, but I really, I loved it, right? So I loved the idea of chemistry. And I went to my teacher and I said, hey, listen, I know I'm just barely meeting the grades. I'm like on the bubble. I really want to get your endorsement for AP. And he he believed in me and he endorsed he endorsed uh, me taking the class. And that was like one of my very first teachers that I felt like totally believed in the potential. And that completely changed my confidence. So wow. as I then went through that course and, you know, I basically got a B average. I think I got an 83 for the whole year, but it was advanced placement. So it was a little bit harder. I wanted to marry like my dad's profession of sales and my mom's profession of nursing into something that I thought could give back. Right. So, and I thought, well, you know, I could maybe mix the two, like the science with the sales and marketing aspect. So I went, I first started college and I was going to be pre ophthalmology. I was going to be an eye doctor. Hmm. And then I realized, well, I'm not sure if I want to be this. I was 17. I'm like, do I really know what I want to be when I grow up? And this is like Mm -hmm. a big commitment. Like I'm sort of putting all my eggs in one basket. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, ah, not so much. So I changed to marketing. I was like, well, I'm going to do this because I think marketing can connect people. It can change the world when it's done in in an appropriate way, in an ethical way. And that's, that was my, my focus. And I thought like getting into healthcare in some form or fashion, because being healthy was always important to me based on my interest in sports. So I thought maybe I could combine the two. Like in, in one of the things that was really starting to take off here in the States was pharmaceutical sales. Yeah. So I thought, wow, what a great combination. Like I can sell something that could really give back. So when people don't have their health, they all, all they want is to be healthy. And there might be a treatment out there that I could be a part of to change their lives. It brings in my mom's nursing background and my sales side from my dad into one. I was like, mm. this is going to be my focus. And so I tried to interview for jobs out of college as I was graduating. But a lot of people were like, you don't have any sales experience, son. Go <laughs> out and get some sales experience. So I was like, all right. So I got my first sales job when I left uh, university in Virginia. I moved to Washington, D.C. And I started selling copiers and facsimiles. If we, you know, <laughs> mm. some of your listeners might remember the day of the facsimile. Now we don't like, what's that? Yeah, right? What's exactly. a fax machine? So, and I used to sell the facsimiles with the curly paper, yeah. right? So that's, that's how old I am. Not the plain, <laughs> not the nice paper now. And so I did that in the roughest parts of DC. Wow. Like I had Capitol Hill, which back then was, if you went East in Washington, DC, the neighborhoods got rougher. They get, became poorer. You know, they were sort of the forgotten neighborhoods of D.C. And I, that was my territory. And so I, you know, this, you know, white white dude from like suburban upstate New York was like driving around in his little Toyota Corolla type of car <laughs> selling copiers and facsimiles. And I did it for 20 months and I was actually really good at it. Cool. But I knew I didn't want to stay in it. I knew I still wanted to get into pharmaceuticals. So after 20 months, I finally landed my first pharmaceutical gig. And that started my 22-year industry, 22-year uh, you know, run in the industry. So uh, crazy stuff. 
I actually wow. think they've uh, they've made a movie about you, but uh, it's uh, with Will Smith called The Pursuit yeah. of Happiness. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so when I watch the Will Smith movie, I'm like, oh, dude, I feel your pain. Like, I was like, I would be carrying around these copiers and faxes. I had one. I had one case. So we had to, we had to like demonstrate the copier, right? So if a customer wanted to buy a copier they would bring the copier in for like a, a week and give it to them to try it out. Right. Um, sort of test drive it. Yeah. And after the test drive, the theory was they were going to love it so much. It's going to be easy to sell it. <laughs> so I actually brought a copier into the think tank in Washington, DC. That was a Republican think tank that w actually was the seed of Obamacare healthcare reform in the States. So they're pretty big players. So I bring in this copier and I'm like, I'm like, I'm 22. I got like my best $99 suit on. And I'm like, <laughs> like all the people around there, are like 10 people around trying to learn the copier. Many of them were executive assistants. So many of them were women, like, you know, uh, people my age, you know, like in their twenties. And I was like, yeah, I'm a young buck. And I'm like, so cool. And, <laughs> and I'm going to impress these women and, they're going to fall in love with me and the whole thing, like crazy <laughs> stuff, right? So, you know, a lot of stuff goes through your head that you don't, really don't want to make public, but I'm making it public now. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm doing, so they tell you to, to like crumple up a piece of paper for the demo. And you, basically the script is, let me just crumple up this piece of paper and send it through the copier and show you like how great this copier is. They even like <laughs> tattered and torn paper can go with ease, right? And so I did that. And I hit the green button to print and it gets stuck. <laughs> but what happened is it got stuck on the hot drum that prints the paper. Uh -huh. So all of a sudden the piece of paper starts to catch on fire. Oh so now God. the copier is on fire inside. Now it wasn't a huge inferno or a big blaze, but here it is. The, the paper is on fire. It's smoldering. You can smell it. Right. And I'm trying to get in there to oh. pat it down. And now I'm getting all the toner cartridge ink all over oh, my wow. hands. And, and your so, ego is going up in smoke as well. Yeah, and, and I'm like, I'm starting <laughs> to sweat. I'm like, I'm just like, it's so embarrassing. And I'm like, these girls are never going to want to go out with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we put the fire out, but I had ink all over my hands. And I found a way to sort of get out of the demonstration as quickly as possible and just sort of bury my head in the sand. <laughs> but here's, here's the punchline. They ended up buying the copier. No way. So, oh. Yeah. It's like, I, cause I never thought like, they're never going to buy this. And they're like, yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, your demo sucked, <laughs> but the copier is good. So we're going to buy it. So, um, and so I was like, I got to get that. copy has sucked those days. <laughs> yeah. No, it was, that uh, was still a decent. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, so I think of Will Smith a lot, like the pursuit of happiness. I, you know, like I had moments where like it was all commissioned. So I had days, I had months where I was like huge, right. I, I made a killing and I was like, happy hours on me. And we'd go out every night and it'd be like, you know, yeah. you know, hooray. And then there are moments where it was three days before payday and I had nothing in my bank account. Yeah. Cause I didn't, Back then, I wasn't really good at managing my money very well. And so when I got a big bolus of money, I spent it. And then when I didn't, I just put stuff on credit cards. So I had some I had some really lean months because that was also the time that the U.S. was going through a recession. OK. And I had some glorious months. But it was that it was that yo-yo of commission sales that was that was just so painful. So 20 months and um got my first gig it was a cool. lot like um i'm not sure if you guys know the movie glenn gary glenn ross but it's a great like u.s it's a, based on a play but it's a great u.s movie with alec baldwin and some other people and it's like cutthroat sales and that was my life for the my in my early 20s until i got a, a really uh professional pharmaceutical gig <laughs> wow um so it, it makes me think a little bit of the of the office as well when you know that all the antics that can happen in in facsimile and copier sales <laughs> yeah i know i, I live that life I, it, I have some great friends from it i'm actually going to one of um one of the guys is getting remarried next week so i'm off to i'm off to his uh wedding and so the the pain brought us together yeah for sure
Yeah, that's really cool. And so just what what university were you at in Virginia? Was it uh, UVA or Virginia Tech or? Uh, James Madison University. Oh, James Madison. Sorry. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, I, I, I've actually went, uh, when I, I worked in America in 99 in a summer camp and I went to meet some of the guys that I worked with in the summer camp in, uh, in Virginia and we went to, they were at UVA and uh, we went to uh, an American football game there to watch uh, UVA versus Virginia Tech and it was like, for me it was like the movies, you know, like for us you check, you know, these massive crowds at football games and then afterwards they have these uh, house parties where everyone like goes around and it was exactly that. It was... So that's my um, memory of Virginia, just like one of the best places in the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they, they say it's uh, Virginia's for lovers. So that's the state like tourism slogan. But yeah, UVA was about 45 minutes away from my university. But yeah, football, American football yeah, on a college level. Whew, that's a totally different beast. But it's it's not unlike like, you know, international soccer like you know we watch international soccer and like the crowds are totally into it and, yeah um they say you know that the loyalty is there uh there's something special about collegiate football here in the states that people just get they get all riled up about their alma mater yeah yeah for sure yeah, and they and they get paid pretty darn well and uh well not the players themselves it's quite a it's quite an interesting scenario like the, how much money is in it and and uh and then the the lack of payment for the players and things like that when they're at college and it's quite an interesting scenario how that all works over there it's crazy actually when you look at the most um well-paid uh employee of the state it's usually the head football coach so if you take yeah. like the university of virginia university of alabama um the university of florida like you go through all the, like the state universities the big ones and you look at all the paid officials in the state. So starting with the governor and all the other state employees, the football uh, coach is paid probably like 10x what everyone wow. else gets paid. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. And the players get the players get nothing. Wow. It's yeah. it's such a weird economic model. But yeah, some of the football like the top football coaches, they can get three to five to six million dollars a year. Wow. And so the go and the governor, I don't know what a governor makes, but I don't think the governor is making much more than like maybe 250k. Wow. Uh -huh. It's just it's a cra it's just the economics are just insane. And then as a father of a college student right now and one to be in a couple years, when I think about the tuition, like tuitions now in the state for like to go to a, a year of university, it's like 60 to getting close to $70,000 a year. What? Yeah. Wow, that's insane. So four years, you got like, you're at, you're like at a, like a quarter of a, you know, quarter of a million dollars for university. Jesus. It's just, wow. it's insane. It's just, it, it's a crazy, it's a crazy economic system that yeah. one day I do think it's a bubble that bursts somehow, how it bursts. I have no clue. I'm not a prognosticator when it comes to like university tuition <laughs> systems, but it's it's way out of whack. So if you have privilege, if you have the money or if you can get a merit scholarship, that can reduce the cost or make the burden less so. But if you're in the middle, right, it's hard. You're not going to get a merit. Maybe uh, you're not going to necessarily make the economic threshold to get some financial assistance. Mm. And so then, and then you come out out of college with a lot of debt, and and that was sort of my case. Like my parents never really saved for for us for college. That yeah. neither of them went to like a standard four year university. So I came out of I came out of college with a whole bunch of debt. So the first few years of my my professional life was I got busy just paying down my debt and trying to make trying to make wise wise financial decisions yeah, yeah we've heard that from a number of our, of our guests from from the states and that is end up with a lot of debts and it actually makes you think when you're when you're a young kid and they say what do you want to be when you grow up it, it sh should shouldn't be i want to be a football player i want to be it should be i, sh I want to be a football coach <laughs> yeah. sounds like the way to go <laughs> yeah no that's that's your spot on craig that's absolutely the case but you I, make you make more money you don't get injured 
Yeah. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, though, walk us through. So you, you, you finished, you know, at the, your job with the um, copiers and um, facsimiles and it said all that. Um, now you get the job in a pharmaceutical company. Um, and what is that? I mean, these companies are massive and they, they very complicated and make lots of money and what have you. Um, there's some controversy around all of that, that whole, you know, big pharma, we hear all about these things sometimes, but what was, what was it like for you going into this big world of pharmaceuticals and, uh, and where did you start off? Yeah, so my first my first job was right there in D.C. So I actually started off with a very small firm. Uh, so some of the big firms, it was sort of the bureaucracy to like, who did you know to get a job? And one of the things I was starting to learn about myself is I sort of like things sort of off on the edge, just like not right in the mainstream, not like big pharma, but not not widely off on the fringes, but just slightly, you know, left or right of center, like just different enough. But not so different. It was like a head scratcher, or like that's a weird decision. So I found a small firm called Schwartz Pharma. They were based in Germany uh, internationally, but in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in the states. And they only had about when I started about ninety six representatives. So it was small. It was almost like a like a big family, as opposed to the massive companies that we know of, like a Glaxo uh, uh, or a Pfizer or a Merck, where they had thousands upon thousands of representatives. So I felt like, wow, it was a small pond. And I could, you know, if I worked really hard, I could make a name for myself. And I went in not really thinking like, okay, what do I want out of this? I just wanted a gig. And again, sort of mindlessly going through it, I thought, well, society tells you to get the job, you start at an entry level, you're an individual contributor, and then you work your way up to a manager. So I was like, well, that's what I'm going to do. Without really thinking about like, what do you really want to do? And I, I think this happens to a whole bunch of people. Just like my upbringing yeah. happens yeah. to a whole bunch of people. We just sort of go through like, well, this is what society tells you to do, that you have to become the manager. And so I did that for a while. I did some stuff in sales training. I got promoted into their hospital division. And then the company had this great drug. We we're waiting FDA approval. And it got rejected. So there were 20 of us in this hospital division. Again, this breakthrough was going to be monumental for people with vascular disease, but the FDA said, no go, can't approve the drug. And so I was part of like an elite group of 20. By this time, the company had grown to about, I think about 200 reps. So we doubled in those four years and they decided to lay the 20 of us off. Oh wow! Like wow. I lost my job. And I was like, what are you? I'm like, I was, I was so pissed. I was yeah. so, I, I was easily angry back then. I was like, what are you talking about? Like we're the best of you guys and you're laying us off like this wow. is ridiculous you can take your rhetoric and you can <laughs> shove it you know like and i was like and i was close to some of the people in the home office and and if i wasn't i probably wouldn't have talked that way but i was like really familiar with them i was like this is so wrong like and they're like well well we want to hire you back and so they basically said listen uh we have like 10 open territories across the states do you want one of those? Because we still want to keep you, but we can't keep you in that territory in D.C. because the job no longer exists. So my wife and I, we I was married at the time and, and still am. 24 years of marriage next month we celebrate, which is totally Congrats. cool. Congratulations. And we decided to move to Vermont. We're like, hey, let's go to Vermont. And Vermont sounded really cool, like bed and breakfast and like <laughs> Ben and Jerry's and the snow and you know it's just vermont's just cute yeah and so we did that because i was like well i want to stay with the company because i was like i don't you know I, I was worried about getting another job like is anyone else going to hire me and yeah i was just i was nervous because i had never lost a job before you know like yeah. i just need a job like I, I i have bills to pay i have student loans to pay off i have a you know we had, we didn't have kids yet but i you know i wanted to do my fair share in terms of supporting the house. So we decided to move to Vermont. So we're in DC. Uh, we're, you know, sort of recently married and we're going to move to Vermont. So I moved up to Vermont and I would commute back and forth. And I did that for like three months. And I realized like, what are we doing going to Vermont? Like my wife's job was not, it was hard to get for her to find new employment in Vermont. She was in all the trade association world in DC. And so I decided to leave 
leave there and get a job. And I got a, a job at a big pharma, which is now Novartis. Okay. But back oh. then it was like Siva Geigy and Sandoz before they merged. And I was there um, for a, a three weeks. And then a recruiter called for the opportunity to join this Japanese company called Azai that was coming to the States. And talk about like the universe sort of connecting. So when I got laid off from Schwartz Pharma, they hooked us up with a recruiter, a recruiting firm that was going to help us get a job, sort of out, outplacement services, before I agreed to like go to Vermont for them. And so that recruiter that they gave me was the recruiter that had the assignment for the Japanese startup coming to the States. <laughs> cool. Wow. And so I would have never found this Japanese startup opportunity had I not been downsized by Schwartz Pharma. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so I was all angry back then that this is so wrong, but they get, they planted a seed. It was a gem and I was able to like land employment at this company called Azai. And I stayed there for 18 years and, you Jeez. know, had, had some of the best learning ever. And obviously I lived through what I call my last bad day there, yeah. but it's, it took those 18 years totally shaped me as a person. And I, I am who I am today because of all that time. And I'm, I'm like wildly grateful for those 18 years, but I'm actually really thankful and grateful that Schwartz Pharma downsized me and let me go back then. Mm. Uh, now, not in the moment, right? I was angry in the moment, but yeah. when I look back on it, I was like, wow, that was a total blessing, luck, universe. Yeah. I don't care how you describe it, but wow, so fortunate that that actually happened to me. So great example of like, sometimes your setbacks are really as cliche as this sound are really setups for success for the future. Yeah, totally. For like, sure. like one door closes, another one opens and that sounds, yeah, exactly like what yeah. it is. Yeah. It's, I, it was exactly like that. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, so like at what point did you meet your wife? Did you guys meet in uh, like university or did you meet before that? No. So we met back in 1992 through a personal ad. So, <laughs> so, and then, so this is, you, this is like, you know, yeah. This is before like Match.com and <laughs> Harmony. And so this is Washington, D.C., a lot of the big city papers. I imagine like London has it too and other international cities. They have sort of like a free weekly paper that was more about like entertainment and like things that are happening. So I would get it all the time just to see like what bands were playing at like the, you know, like the local, yeah. local clubs, right? And, and sometimes the big tours, but it was sort of like entertainment. And in the back, they had a personal section, like people could put personal ads in. And I would, you know, our friends would get together and read the personal ads. It'd be like single white male looking for like single white female and vice versa. And I was like, who, who puts these ads in here? Like, <laughs> and like, and the other question was like, who would, who would really answer them? Because some of them were outrageous. And I got to a point where I was like, well, all my friends had you know, dates and girlfriends and stuff like that, or boyfriends. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to try this out. Like I can put an ad in and no one would know it was me. <laughs> so I got really curious and I decided to put a ad in the paper. So I wrote the ad <laughs> and we turned it into actually a wedding favor. It's a magnet. And actually it's on a lot of refrigerators for, <laughs> of a lot of people. So oh, if classic. we lose refrigerators, we might lose the the magnet. <laughs> but I wrote this ad. And so she had never answered the ad. I had never put one in. And she answered the ad on the last day the ad ran. Wow. And the rest is history. We connected for like an hour and a half, our first call. And then again, and I was like, well, um, should we go out on a date? And she was like, <laughs> Yeah. And she was adamant. She was like, I'm, I'm not, I'm going to meet you. This is what she told her girlfriends. I'm going to meet him at the restaurant. It's going to be a public restaurant. I don't know if this guy is some type of pervert or creep or whatever. <laughs> and so she had this whole game plan of like, we're going to meet in public so everyone can see. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, well, let's go out. And, um, so I'll pick you up. And she was like, yeah, here's my address. Pick me up at seven. And so I get, <laughs> went to her apartment. And so her game plan of meeting in public, she threw it out the window and was like, we had our first date and was like, all right. So we had, we had good chemistry and it's, it's lasted as long as it's lasted, which is really cool. There's something so much fun about that in a way. It's like, 
you know, building up to this thing. Nowadays, you just oh, send me a selfie. Oh, you know, oh, I know. I'm not sure if I really want to meet anymore. Or you know, there's so many parameters, I guess, you can put into your online dating and how tall and how whatever. And it, it leaves it leaves so little to just explore the other person's personality and all these other things because you've you've curated so much out of it uh, before you allowed just to like talk on the phone like you guys did initially which is is really cool in a way you, you connect on a very different level first and then and then sort of get to know each other in another way afterwards but um i kind of it sounds kind of a really romantic thing that you did so uh, i wonder have, have have you spoken about it like since and were you both being honest about being the first time on the uh on the uh, <laughs> yeah on the newspaper yeah it was my first time as you're like yeah it was my first time too, I <laughs> so definitely b both of our first times to put an ad put an ad in for me and for her to answer an ad but yeah so like we didn't really know what we looked like there was no photo yeah. there was no internet per se well there was the internet but it wasn't like popular back then in 1992 and i, I so i parked the car and she was this is really, I think, adorable and cute. So she was looking out the window, trying to figure out, like, looking for, like, guys walking by the sidewalk, you know, walk up to her walk. And she was, like, looking out and be like, well, I hope he, maybe it's him. I hope it's him. You know, and so because we had talked, you know, we talked on the phone for up to three hours, but we really didn't know what we looked like. Yeah. And now, like, you can, to your point, Craig, you can know everything about everybody. Like, you just Google them and you can get yeah. their whole – wikipedia nice. story and here we really didn't we didn't know uh, until she opened the door i saw her for the first time and she saw me for the first time and yeah so yeah it's a, a great story I, I actually talk about it in my book and stuff like that but it's the, w the one thing that we do do is we kick ourselves we're like oh god we could have turned this into match right we could have been like <laughs> we met this way yeah. <laughs> and so many people were like you met how like so again going back right now it's commonplace everyone's like oh i met online yeah. i was having dinner with friends last night and they're like yeah we met online so back then there's like people meet online it was like huh like yeah. he's he's got to be a loser right so yeah. he's you know i think her mom actually said well lenny he's got to be a pervert you know you meet him online and she's like <laughs> no no he's a really nice guy he's from upstate new york <laughs> He's really had sort of a vanilla suburban lifestyle. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. it, it's so funny because I was, uh, I don't know when it was, but I was listening to something recently about like what, how date people used to meet, you know, and besides the like newspaper articles, there used to be like a VHS video uh, service. So like you yeah. would record yourself like, um, you know, just with a camera um, onto a VHS and then uh, you'd go to this kind of agency whatever and they'd, they'd have these and then um, you would go there if you wanted to obviously meet somebody or you know and and they would give you like the a bunch of VHSs that were suitable to like what you were kind of looking for and you'd go home and you'd watch <laughs> these things and then you'd go oh, I'd really like to meet this person when you go back it's just like wow. crazy how it's all how it used to be, you know, but it's uh, it's so cool when you think back on it. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, it's sort of, yeah, it's sort of old-fashioned matchmaking and stuff like that. But yeah, we love our story. I like I look at the magnet, and yeah. I knew kind of going back to the marketing question. I knew I had a career in marketing because mm. I had a I had a hook, right? Every good ad needs a hook, and so my oh, line yeah. was my line at the end was not afraid to express her opinions about today's events. So, <laughs> you know, so flashback. 1992 ish it's you know political you know politics are like raging in dc just because politics rage in dc all the time yeah. and a lot was happening in the world as a lot is always happening in the world and i was dating someone i went on a couple dates with someone and she really didn't have a point of view i'm like how do you live in dc <laughs> right and i have a point of view about like politics i for me, it was like, what? I'm like, that's crazy. I was, well, I was judging her, to be honest. But I was like, I just want someone to have a point of view because I really wasn't looking yeah. for like my soulmate. I was just looking for another friend to hang out with and go to clubs and yeah. go to concerts with. Yeah. So I really wanted someone with a point of view. I didn't necessarily have to agree with her. 
I just wanted her to have a little passion. And so she read that line. She was like, oh, not afraid to express her opinions about today's events. She's like, that's me. Mm -hmm. And sure as, you know, shooting, right? So, you know, Seth tells us to like really narrow our niche down. And so I narrowed my niche down with that. And she has delivered. She has opinions about today's events and I love them all. (laughs) That's good. Even though I may not agree with everyone, every one of them, but I do love them all. (laughs) Some people would uh, question your sanity to actually ask for a partner with, uh, you know, full on <laughs> opinions. Uh, and uh, <laughs> But I think it's really awesome. Like you said, it's really, really focused. And you, you I mean, there's no doubting what kind of person it's going to be. And, and it will turn a lot of people away. And a lot of them won't. And it's like actually a really, really smart uh, thing to put in the paper, I reckon. But uh, you know, I, I wanted to actually just go back um, just a, a little bit to to the end of your pharmaceutical days when you said you said something. You said we you had your last bad day, and and I was wondering kind of what that means to you, and and what kind of what what was your sort of typical you know corporate bad day, and and was that part of what what had you started the wheels turning in your head of, of wanting to get out of that environment at that stage? Well, so my last bad day was about my near death cycling accident. So it was July 11th, 2001. So I, I labeled it my last bad day as I was like progressing through my recovery, but going back to that, I'll, you know, I'll share that with y'all and the listeners. So I, w- I had just moved up from Washington, D.C., from D.C. up to New Jersey. So we decided to move into marketing. So the, the whole downsizing at Schwartz Pharma did sort of scare me a bit. I was like, wow, like, you know, I was like top of the charts or like one of the better reps and I still got downsized. And I started thinking, well, there's a lot of people who are great reps who then go on to managers and they're a dime a dozen here in the States. So how am I different, right? So at that moment in time, I started really thinking about like my old life of sort of vanilla suburban, like not too different, right? Just like average. And I thought, you know, you know what? Average, average has risk, right? Because I'm not going to, you know, how do I differentiate myself? So when I joined Aza, I was like, well, I'm going to differentiate myself by getting different experiences so I can look at the business from an enterprise view. So I could have gone into sales management. Instead, we moved to New Jersey to take on a marketing job. But I still was, you know, even though I had this a little bit of aha about trying to differentiate myself, I was still really busy chasing happiness. So I was a really great human doer, you know, doing the to-do list, adding things on my to-do list that I had already done just to cross them off your to-do list, that type of guy. Yeah. And I was really like busy just, chasing happiness, almost like a, a hamster on its wheel. Let's just go and go and go and go and going, thinking I had to have all the answers at work, sort of like be Superman at work. And also I had to be like the guy in Superman at home. So I had to do all of that. And what was, what I was doing was just pouring all the stress inside of me. So I was trying to put on a really great game face. Like I got all this, I'm good, but I was filled with comparison. Like what other other colleagues made what their titles were the people around us as far as like their material possessions and i was just going 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 and pouring the stress inside and inside and then we went to a meeting in new uh new mexico it was a classic like monday to friday type of thing and i brought my bike out i thought well let's bring our bike out and we'll get some exercise in. i'll avoid the hotel gym cross new mexico off the states i've ridden my bike in and everything will be great. And so I brought my bike out, got ready the morning of July 11, 2001. And I was doing laps around the hotel property. I found a two mile loop. And on the fourth lap, I came around a bend and a Ford Explorer was coming right at me. Big uh, SUV. He was going about 40 miles an hour. He was completely into my lane. It was surreal. I had no reaction time. And then I remember the sound of me hitting his grill and then getting tossed up and into his windshield, that sound where it like smashed into the windshield and then the screech of his brakes. And then the thought I made as I came to the oh. asphalt below. And of course, as one would imagine that, that knocked me unconscious. And then the EMTs arrived a few minutes later and I regained consciousness. 
Wow. And that was the start of my last wow. bad day. So, so, so the, the strange thing yeah. is like, or well, not strange, like you actually remember it happening because often what happens is your mind kind of just shuts those moments out. But you, you can, so you can actually picture this thing coming in, you know, in front of you now to this day. To this day, like wow. I can, I can easily, like, as I was just sharing it with you guys, like I could see the whole scene. Like it's the, the hotel we were at was built on native American land. So it's a little desolate and like, there's not a lot of, uh, forest or shrubbery or and stuff like that. It was sort of open, like desert. It was about 45 minutes North of Albuquerque, New Mexico and South of Santa Fe. So in the middle of New Mexico. Yeah. And the sun was coming up over the, the mountain range to the, to the East. And yeah, the, it came right at me. I can still see it. Jeez. And just like that whole, the whole, that whole scene. And wow. I, I, yeah, st to this day, I still can remember it now t for the listeners. It doesn't haunt me. Like I don't go around being like, woo, you know, getting like yeah. sh you know, shooken up by it, but it's just like that happened and it's factual and I can see it all. The, the funny thing about it is like, I tend to use humor to cut tension from time to time. So when I came, <laughs> when I came, to consciousness again, I asked the EMTs, and this is a question only another cyclist can really appreciate. I asked them, like, how's my bike? <laughs> and they're like, huh? <laughs> I, I, how's my bike? <laughs> and I was like, keep in mind, I was in the worst pain of my life. Like, even the thought of moving was painful. And I wow. knew, like, I knew things were grim. Yeah. Not by what the EMT said, but just by, like, vibe and energy. Like, I knew, like, I was in a whole mm -hmm. bunch of... I was in a hot mess and it was not good. Uh, just the pain was just, the pain was just intense. Like, again, nothing like I had ever felt in my life. And I remember thinking like, I wonder if this is what it feels like to die. And wow. I kept on telling myself, and this is a little bit of my, the, in my past, my control stuff, right? I was going to, you know, control things to chase my happiness, the whole thing. And I kept on telling myself, Michael, whatever you do, do not fall asleep. You know, stay awake. Don't fall asleep. Mm -hmm. I thought if I fell asleep, I may never wake up again. And I thought wow. if I stayed awake, I could have control over the situation. As crazy as that sounds, but, you know, our brain does wacky crap in these moments. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I'll stay awake. And the the EMTs, by now, there's like an army of EMTs. Uh, the driver, he went into shock because a whole bunch of glass went into his face. And so they're trying to treat him. They're trying to treat me. And they said they called a, a trauma helicopter to bring me to the trauma center in Albuquerque because I was too far away to be driven by ambulance. So I just waited for the helicopter to come. And they said it's going to be 19 minutes. And when the helicopter started to land, I could hear the whirling you know, sound of the blades. I told myself, if I live life is going to be different. I'm going to stop wow. chasing happiness. I'm just going to be. Wow. Because again, I was a really good human doer. I wasn't really a great human being. Mm. And, you know, things things happen for reasons, right? The whole Schwartz Pharma, getting downsized, getting that recruiter that ended up giving me a job at Azi. Now, in hindsight, like in the moment, I was like, well, things are happening for a reason, Michael. Just accept this moment, right? I was freaking wow. out inside. Yeah. But you know, things, things happen for a reason, right? The universe need the universe or whomever wanted to give me a wake up call to say, Hey, Hey buddy, you got to stop chasing happiness and get into it's like more mindfulness and be more conscious about how you're showing up. Mm. And again, I didn't know that at the time I was just worried about like, Oh my God, like what is going on? I haven't had a thought like, I wonder what people, here it goes back to the judgment piece, right? I was like, I wonder what my colleagues are saying about me right now because I'm late for the meeting. Mm. Wow, yeah. And I was like, so I was like, because I hate being late. And I was like, they're all judging me because I'm not at the meeting. They're Because <laughs> I was the boss, I was like one of the bosses. And I was like, I was getting all worried about that. And it was, it was so absurd. Like now I think about it, like that is so crazy, stupid shit, yeah. right? Yeah. And <laughs> but that's what I went through my that's what was going through my head. And I got on that helicopter and I never took my eyes off my flight nurse for those 19 minutes. In fact, you know, I can look 
over here in the corner and there's a poster of uh, the whole helicopter crew. And before yeah. every bike ride now, I see the helmet I wore that day and I see the picture of my helicopter crew. Wow. As a reminder That's of just being grateful. And 19 minutes later, we landed on the rooftop at the University of New Mexico at Albuquerque. And down the elevator, we went right into the trauma operating room. I met my surgeon, I met my anesthesiologist, and then I don't remember a thing for the next like four days and wow. change. Wow. -wee. That usually happens after you see an anesthesiologist. Uh, <laughs> like, yes. You, you're gone now. <laughs> but um, I wanted to ask you, that's, I mean, it's a harrowing story, obviously. I mean, it's so scary that how much you remember in a way, because I think like Gareth was saying, you know, oftentimes your brain just switches off. That's a bad memory and you never, never recollect any of it. But so you have this sort of unique thing of, of remembering a really traumatic event. So I guess you can access that nowadays to, to remind you of to be present and all that, which is, I suppose, on, in some strange way, like a, a, good, a good thing to have. But what was your, I mean, 19 minutes for the helicopter to arrive and then you still had to fly another 19 odd back like that must have felt like such a long time number one and number two what did, did you think about I mean you were you were considering that you might pass away so so had you considered you know the stereotypical family members and and did you have kids at this stage had you did you obviously think about all of them or did you fixate on the office I know it sounds like a strange question but no no I so I definitely thought about them so I the the actual series of questions was how's my bike? Like, what are my office mates going to think about me? And then I was like, ah, oh, my family. Now, so, you know, to be wow. honest, the family question should have been the first one. Right. So, but I was like, the way I looked at my job was I was provider for family. And so job was provider for family. And I thought about, wow, like, What's Lynn going to say? And, and my girls were young at the time. So Elle was three and a half years old. Grady was seven months old. And I really thought, like, we don't need this now. Like, we were two parents trying to juggle, like, a newborn. You know, Grady, again, seven months old. So she's relatively new into life. And we were trying to juggle the transition from one child to two child, two children. And, and like, the balance and my job and her 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 interests and what she was pursuing. And yeah, I was like, this, we I, like, this is going to be a bad phone call to win. Wow. And, and I, I thought about that and I, I, then I was, but then at, meanwhile, I was just willing myself to stay awake. And then I said, I have to like, I have to start showing up differently in life. Like this is, you know, I didn't in the moment, I didn't call it like a wake up, but I knew like, like if I get through this, then I have to show up differently. And what I didn't realize at the time, so that question about life and death was real. I broke a whole bunch of everything, but the massive injury was that my left femur shattered when it hit the truck. Wow. And when the bone shattered, it lacerated my femoral artery in my left leg. Ooh. Wow. So the doctors told my wife later that if I was 10 years older or not in shape, I would have probably died before I got to the hospital. Jeez. So, cause I, when you look at the scene of the accident, it was like blood stained. Like there was like, wow. I'll put like, they, they cleaned it up with bleach. And so photos after the accident was cleared, there was this big, like bleach stained part of the road from where I was, where I was. And so a lot Jeez. of blood, the first surgery, I needed about 35, 34 units of blood product. Wow. First surgery lasted 10 hours. Sure. I was... Yeah, I was a mess. Um, and, wow. and and initially they called Lynn out and they were like, hey, Michael's been in an accident. The, the comp My company called her, said, you should really come out. Looks like you broke both legs. They didn't know the extent of the injuries. And she's like, I, "Like it's busy here. Like I got a newborn. I got a three and a half year old. Like life is happening. Can you just fix his broken bones and send him back? <laughs> yeah. You know, thinking like, well, he's been in accidents before, like just bike racing accidents like it's road rash and, and yeah. the way the phone calls were going it was somewhat understated and then on the third call a different person from my company called her a real higher up kind of guy and who she knew 
uh, just because of my involvement in the company. And she was like, oh. And so she was like, well, what do I do? He goes, well, you should pack for about a week or so. Wow. And she was like, huh? Mm-hmm. And so she got on the airplane. And she was thinking, well, by the time I get out to Albuquerque, Michael will be in recovery. And so she flew from Newark to Houston. She called the hospital when she landed in Houston. I was still in the OR. And she wow. was like, well, that's weird. Like, hmm. She was like, well, they probably had some big emergency. And they put the emergency ahead of Michael because he's just had Jeez. two broken legs. So she's just thinking, hmm. And so she got a cookie, like a, this macadamia nut cookie she, she got at the airport. And she was like, oh, Michael will like this in recovery. Oh, so wow. she had it all wrapped up. And so she gets to the hotel. My company has set up um, a nanny or babysitter for Grady. So she flew out with Grady, my youngest, and L, our oldest, stayed back with friends. And she's like telling, you know, she's telling the nanny, the babysitter, like how to tr- treat and care for Grady. And she's going on and on and on, very thorough as she is. And the nanny was told, like, listen, you're about to care for this child of this mom, and her husband's about to die. Wow. Jeez. And so the nanny's listening to her, like, woman, like, shouldn't you go to the hospital? Your husband's going, like, yeah. yeah. And so, and Liz being really thorough with the explanation, and she gets to the hospital, and I'm still in the OR. And Jeez. she's like, whoa, like, what's going on? And then she was like, I don't care who comes out of that OR next. I want to know what the heck is going on with my husband, right? And the vascular surgeon came out and said, you know, your husband's been in a very bad accident. We did the best we could. The next 72 hours are going to be really critical. Cheapest. Wow. And at this time, it's like late in the day. She goes back to the hotel. Uh, I think she threw the cookie out. And she was like, holy cow. Like, life just got turned upside down completely. And... Then the next four days and change, I was in the ICU, in which I don't remember any of that. But a lot of funny stories happened. Like I interviewed her for a job. (laughs) So she came in one morning. I was like, hey, pleasure to meet you. (laughs) Michael O'Brien, I just have some questions to ask you about employment here. And I went through a whole job interview with her. She was <laughs> laughing hysterically. <laughs> and I said, I'm a, it's going to be a while to, before I can get back to you. You know, I've been in a very bad accident. No so, way. You know, <laughs> yeah. So she was writing oh, all this man. down. And so I didn't hire her. I told her to buy Amazon stock, which we didn't do. It was $15 <laughs> a share Jeez. back then. Uh, you know, I was, I was saying a lot of funny things because I was like on a tremendous amount of drugs. And I was agitated. They had me strapped down. It was, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a mess. And then I came out, I came out of the ICU and I was still in traction. So the first surgery, all they could do was fix my left leg. They put my right leg in traction because that was broken as well in multiple places. And so they wheeled me in. I woke up in the middle of the night all by myself. And I was like, where am oh my I? God. Like oh, my leg man. is in traction. I'm in the worst pain. Like no one's around me because it's after visiting wow. hours and I'm like, holy cow. Like, and I could like, I couldn't move. I still had glass mm. in my face. Like I still Jeez. was picking out like weeks would go on in my recovery and I still pick out like, I would be like touching my cheek and I'd be like, what's that? Like mm. I thought I didn't shave well. And I was like, oh, it's, it's a piece of glass from the windshield. It was wow. like crazy, crazy stuff. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's crazy. And and ha- have you ever met the guy who hits you? Well, so we had to go back out for traffic, a traffic court case. So the traffic court case was in the courthouse for the Pueblo, for the Native American village. And it was it was just poverty, right? So, you know, we think about in the States a lot, inner city, inner, inner city poverty, or maybe poverty in like Appalachia and stuff like that. But, you know, there was a lot of poverty in Native American Pueblos before like casinos started really popping up and they didn't have a casino back then. So this courthouse was like a one room courthouse. It was sort of at like out of the Wild West movies in America back in the 50s and 60s. It was run down, dilapidated. And here we are, we're all sort of huddled into this like small little room room and he's right there and wow it was it was so tense i didn't know what to say to him he didn't know what to say to me 
you know, the judge chewed him out. He sort of mumbled things because I think he was he had a lot of regret and a lot of remorse. He was driving with a revoked license. So he should have never been driving that day. And I just didn't know what to say. Now, luckily, right, my wife is not afraid to express her opinions about today's events. <laughs> so she didn't chew him out, but she definitely made a pitch to the court about his sentence and like what would happen to him. Cause I, I did, I didn't know what to say. I was like overcome with emotion and I just, and I just shut down yeah. to be honest. And I just want, I really wanted the whole experience to be over. And yeah. uh, luckily she said something and she was like a lot of passion about what it, what it meant from, from her perspective and like what her daughter's lost. Cause you know, this guy took something away from, their father and like what she lost as a spouse, as a wife. And it was, yeah. So she was like, it was like a proud, it was a proud husband moment. I was like, you go, you wow. keep talking because I can't talk right now without like breaking down in, in just a puddle. Yeah. But she was, yeah, she was totally awesome. Uh, isn't it the, the people around us uh, in those moments, they just, the people that really love you just shine. And she sounds like a really, really amazing woman, strong woman. I was wondering what she felt in those first four days when she realized this accident is really serious and, you know, you're in trouble. I would imagine there's a moment when it dawns on you that the recovery is going to be a long time. This is not a joke. What is, what is the next step for someone in that scenario? Like, how do you get your life organized for probably the next six months um, with not working and getting around at home with fam with a young family. Awesome question. Awesome question about what, what we do next. So she went into do mode, like win it to win it mode. And she just started getting really organized. So one of the great skills she has is she can like organize the heck out of things. And she just started going through and contacting people in our lives that she felt could help, right? So we had to figure out like insurance and like mm -hmm. medical care and coming back. And the doctor said, hey, listen, you're gonna have a lifetime of limitations and dependencies and future surgeries. And what was a real struggle is here we are in New Mexico and my oldest daughter is back with friends. This is the first time Elle had been away from us in her life. So the first two days, it's like, oh, yeah, sleepover, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a three and a half year old. But as time started going on, you could tell in her voice, she was like getting worried. She was missing mom and dad. She wanted to know what was going on. And we were having a devil of a time finding a hospital that was going to accept us. Wow. Because I was a trauma one patient. I was still really messed up. And so we were trying to call around other hospitals, like which hospital would accept us. And I didn't have a doctor back then. So I was, you know, early 30s. So I, I never went to the doctor. Hmm. Like, so I didn't have a relationship built up with a primary care physician to say, hey, we can admit you at this local hospital. Hmm. So we got accepted to the hospital closest to our house, but they weren't a trauma one center. And the doctors were like, no can do. You have to go to a trauma one center. Like you are still significantly damaged as I was, you know, I still had, like, I had these things called fasciotomies, which is basically what they do is they uh, cut your leg open because I had lost so much blood. I need so much blood to replenish my supplies. I blew up like the Michelin man. I got all swollen in order to prevent compartmental syndrome from happening. They basically want to open the leg up. So they make an incision and the leg just expands. So when it does that, it like it leaves like a like a patch like this of just open an open wound because wow. the legs just expanding. Right. And so I still had these. And so I had to get skin graft operation to close those. So I had to go to a, the proper hospital for my condition. So she's going through all this stuff and I'm trying to just like get by and it was it was a struggle. My parents flew out to New Mexico, when they came out to New Mexico, I was like, oh my God, like I am, I'm really messed up. Yeah. It was the first time my mom had been on a flight in 27 years. Jeez. Wow. She was terrified of flying it. So I knew if she flew out, like, holy cow. Yeah. And I, 
you know, I was barely like, I couldn't sleep. I was uncomfortable. I was, you know, my shoulder was also broken. So, and they didn't really fix that. They just let nature fix that. So I couldn't really move around. There was a lot of stuff I was dealing with, but Lynn was trying to get everything in order. So fly out to another hospital in New Jersey. So after 10 days, we, we felt we, we needed to get back home. I flew, flew back to New Jersey. I developed a blood clot on the flight. They no moved me to a new hospital for my skin graft operation. And then subsequently, we moved to uh, another rehab hospital. So I was in the hospital for like three months and change. And what Lynn was doing was, so here it is. She's got two kids under four. So she would wake up, she would get them ready for like their activities, preschool. I was in preschool. And then she would drive, she would drive to the hospital, visit with me. And then uh, we'd conclude our visit. And then she would drive home, do her the stuff with the kids. And then in the afternoon, she would come back out again with the kids. So she was driving 45 minutes each way, twice a day, every day. And when I would come out, the way when she would come out, like I would get exhausted so easily. Like some visits, like with the kids, it'd be a 20 minute visit. And it was so intense. Like from my perspective, I was like, I really need to go sleep. I'm like, I'm exhausted. I was exhausted all the time. And so here she is. She drove, she got the kids in the car seats. She drove out through rush hour traffic, oh, wow. 45 minutes. We get there, we're having time as a family, and then 20 minutes later, I'm like, I'm really sleepy. I need to go to sleep. Yeah. And then she packs them back up again. She did this every day while I was there. And one of the things that's really special is that she brought lemonade for me for lunch every day. So <laughs> now, now when I drink lemonade, she's totally like, lemonade to me is like pure compassion and love. Wow. And before, it was just like a drink you would have for lunch. Now it's like totally different. That's cool. <clears throat> so, um, but yeah, so that, that rhythm. And so after a while we were, we were really eager to get back home, you know, just to have some sense of normalcy, but I had to, you know, get cleared. Like for the longest time I was in a wheelchair and I, I you know, I, I couldn't bathe myself. Heck, I couldn't even go to the bathroom myself. And so that was those moments really felt like I had no dignity left. Right. So yeah. when you have to, as an adult, when you have to call someone to use the bathroom or, you know, as, you know, this is real life, right? This is, you know, ridiculously yeah. human. I had to call someone to sort of wipe my bum. Wow. Right. So yeah. I'd be like on a bedpan. So my book title originally was titled uh, Life Looks Different on Top of a Bedpan. Because <laughs> everyone was so focused on like, did Michael move his bowels? Like, you know, because when you have surgery that's intense as I, I have or any surgery, they want you to move your GI system forward. And I was I was all messed up. So, you know, they give you a bedpan. Everyone's outside waiting for you to poop. Right. So <laughs> and you're just sitting there and it's nothing's coming out easily. Right. Oh, and wow. then you got to call another adult to say, I need to get cleaned up. And I just felt like so alone yeah. and again, without any dignity. I'm like, this is like, th th those are the aspects of the recovery that do go missing a lot. Like that feeling of just helplessness, mm. especially coming from a point of view where I thought I had to be Superman yeah. at work or at home. Like I had to have the answer. Now, no one, no one told me I had to have the answer. I just thought that's what society wanted you to do. Going back to that, like in the past, like as a leader, society says you should have the answer. As the dad, the patriarch of the family, you should have the answer. So it wasn't like my wife said you have to have the answer or my boss at work said you have to have all the answers. I just thought that's what you do. And so then I had that identity and then fast forward into my recovery and I lost my identity. And so it was so hard to like fixate. It was so hard to fixate on the things I was grateful for. All I saw were the things I didn't have anymore, like independence or I couldn't do anymore. Mm -hmm. And I went, I went dark. I got really angry, frustrated, sad, uh, worried, revengeful. There were moments where in the middle of the night, I would be like, how can I get back at the driver? He took from me. Wow. Eye for an eye, I will take from him. And I, I, I like thought of schemes. And then I realized when I was back in New Jersey, what, at one of the hospitals, I realized if I was going to actually be the father and husband and person and leader 
I wanted to become not comparing myself to anybody else, just like being the best me I could be that I had to start shifting my mindset and I had to start practicing gratitude. I had to start thinking about what I had and still could do uh, because I still had a whole bunch. And so I really had to sort of embrace like, where was I fortunate in all this? Cause a lot of people are like, you're so lucky you're here, you're alive. And I'm like, I'm not lucky. I go, I wanted to be lucky yeah. in the early part of the recovery. I was like, I want to be, I wanted to be lucky about five seconds before the truck hit me. Yeah. Where was my, yeah. where was my luck then? Like, and where people yeah. would say, God was looking out for you. I go, yeah, you know, the five seconds before I got hit, God was falling asleep, drinking his latte. <laughs> I was like, I was really pissed. Like when people would say that. I'd be like, you know sure. what? Tell God <laughs> and tell your luck that they missed the boat because they had an opportunity to be godlike and lucky and they they failed miserably because <laughs> yeah. I got hit. Wow. So yeah. in the early part, I like that's how I felt. And then I realized, well, you know what? I was lucky. Like oh. I I could have died, right? I it, the accident could have been worse. I could have ended up being a, a paraplegic, a quadriplegic. Yeah. I could have had a traumatic brain injury. I could have had like it could have been so much worse. And then I started, you know, working on just myself and being more mindful and being more conscious and being more grateful and all that jazz. So I could change the story that I was telling myself, like, I'm a victim to I'm resilient. Right. So the whole Viktor Frankl quote, like, we're not defined by our events in our lives. We are defined by how we respond to them. And I was like, instead of saying, why me? I was like, why not me? Like, I could be I could be defined by how I respond to this. I could be a really great yeah. role model for my girls. I I can get back up again because you are resilient. That's that was one of my dormant superpowers when I was growing up. Like I could just keep going. You know, I was like, well, I've I've fallen down majorly here. I'm gonna get back up again. I'm just gonna continue going. I'm gonna sort of keep pedaling, if you will. Yeah. Gosh, my, my, Mark, that's an amazing. Um, uh, what a heartful felt story, but um, what a way to be forced to become mindful and be present with yourself and your own thoughts. Hey, like you were just totally thrust, was thrust upon you in a, in a horrible way, but obviously you totally explore, explored your your innermost workings and your deepest thoughts and and there's something to be said of that. But, you know, before we move on, I'd just like to take a moment to sort of um, – yeah, I found out about the the nurses. I feel like nurses must be some of the most under uh, appreciated people until the moment you're sitting on a bedpan and and they got to come and help you or whatever it is. Like, how was the staff? Like, did you have good experiences, bad experiences? Did you feel like they were out, you know, to support you? And I always feel like nurses are just amazing people. Yeah, they they really are. You know, and my mom. My mom, you know, was a nurse for her whole career, and you know, I got to experience the love and the kindness, you know, and how empathetic they can be, and how gentle and kind they can be when someone's at their most vulnerable moment. You know, like to get a shower, I had to like get into my wheelchair and wheel myself into the shower, and here's, you know, guy has to like bathe me because I can't do it myself, and. You know, people don't necessarily like to be naked in front of other people. You know, you go back yeah. to like seventh grade in the locker room, like as a boy in gym <laughs> class, you're like, oh, I don't want to be naked oh, in yeah. front of anybody. <laughs> and so here, he, like I had no choice. Like that, that was the only way I was really going to get clean. And I, I reeked, right? So it's just like the stench of the hospital and sitting in the same yeah. bed, all lying in the same bed all the time. But yeah, I thought they were incredibly kind. I had one... um nurse uh she was a, a wound care expert and so she would be res she was responsible for cleaning my wounds when i was in new mexico and she took like this unbelievable kindness to the whole procedure and was my advocate right so in terms of like orders on pre-medication because i had to get loaded up on percocet to basically handle the pain of changing my bandages but she was like she was awesome and just loving and i'm you know we're complete strangers, but mm. we're all like, to me, what it underscored is that we're all human beings. And mm. when we can take the time to like pause and really connect with one another, 
we can build really special connections. And in today's world, we're not doing that enough. And that, this isn't For some sure. dis on online and social media, because you can do that. Like we're together because of social media. Yeah. Mm, yeah. But we're running around in our own stuff. We're not mindful. We're not conscious. And so we're, we're missing opportunities to build really great connection. And they showed me like, wow, they, you know, like a lot of, just a lot of care and they, they don't get the fanfare the doctors do. Like the doctors yeah. saved my life, right? That team saved my life. But in a lot of ways, the nurses day in and day out, they did just as much to save my life and put me in this position because of the care to the unsung heroes of the hospital. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally agree. It's like the doctors save your life, but the nurses actually sort of give you life. You know, they sort of they're yeah. just there, and they they are truly amazing ladies. And like you know, my mom is also a nurse, and um, you know, I know the sort of stuff that she went through and stuff like that. And they just really, really care for for people a lot. So, so Michael, um, you know, off the back of this, like like you said, it was a you required a big shift in terms of basically how you viewed the world, how you viewed yourself and, you know, how you treated other people. And like off the back of it, I guess like all these things have some sort of uh, silver lining. So you kind of transformed yourself. And one of the things that you did off the back of that uh, was you, you know, you wrote your own book uh, called Shift. And, you know, from what I know, it basically it's shifting your mindset. And looking at it on Amazon, it's like, wow, it's crazy. Like it's got so many fantastic reviews and obviously people can relate to it. So like at what point did that happen after the accident? And can you just sort of shed a little light on the sort of content of your book? Yeah, no, thanks for asking, Gareth. So early on, I thought, wow, this could be a great book. Right. I'm like, I'm going to write a book. I was like in moments where I was trying to be optimistic with my wife. I'm going to write a book about this. I'm going to I'm going to recover and I'm going to write a book. And then she would leave and I'd be like crying myself. And I was in why why me land. And again, the the working title was like, hey, life looks different on top of a bedpan trying to get use humor to cut the tension. Yeah. And I I was writing out journals and typing in my computer, just different observations along the way. And then I went back to work and I went back to life, but I went, I went back to life on my own terms. I went back to work on my own terms. And then I like the whole idea of writing a book, I was moving up the corporate ladder and I was now an executive and I was like, Oh yeah, that book idea, I, you know, still had it in the back of my, my head, but it, I was, my career was going along nicely. And again, it was on my own terms and I wasn't, chasing happiness anymore. I was really trying to be happy each and every day. Now, some days were better than others, but I really was more grateful and more mindful and all that jazz. And then I decided to leave my job after 18 years in 2014. And then I started meeting all these new people as I got my executive coaching business up and running. And I went to my coaching school to get certified in coaching. And then you do like the whole meet and greet. Well, tell me about your, tell me about your life. Tell me about your story. And I was like, well, here, my last bad day is yada, 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 July 11th, 2001. And everyone was like, oh my God, you have to write your book. You have to write a book. Because wow. in coaching world, they're like, you have to, you have to maximize your seven streams of revenue. And I'm like, I just want to be a good coach. I'm like, <laughs> what's the seven streams of revenue? You got to write your book. It's going to be great for your business. You'll get speaking gigs. You'll, you'll do all that. It's like, this is a great book. And I was like, okay. So then I'd get to my computer. I'm like, everyone tells me I have to write my book. Because society says you have to write a book if you're a coach. Okay. So I still had a little bit of that from my childhood, right? So society says you have to do this. So I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm going to write this book. And then I'd write and I'd be like, ah, oh, it just felt empty. And then someone else would say, you got to write your book. This is really inspiring. It's going to help a whole bunch of people. And then I would write it more and I'd just get stuck. And then I came to the all MBA where we met, you know, through at least, at least through where we met. Yeah. And I was like, I'm going to go into this all MBA. These are comp a bunch of people that I normally don't hang with, right? A lot of creatives, mm -hmm. global. And I'm going to pressure test this whole book idea in this group. So come hell or high water, I'm either going to write this book or not write this book at the end of the all MBA. And then, as you know, Gareth, the first prompt was basically, what is it for? And I'm like, huh, 
Well, that's an easy question, but a hard one to answer. I was like, what's this book for? And I said, the answer was, the book is for my daughters. They're, you know, who are too young to remember pre-accident dad. And the uh, the first few years of like struggle that we had just to try to get to where we are today, because all they see is today. Yeah. And if you look at me, like, you're like, I didn't know you were in such a bad accident. You look fairly normal. Although, like, I lost my Brad Pitt good looks, but, you know, beyond <laughs> that, I look fairly normal. And your memory, but... <laughs> yeah. So, so I was like, I'm going to write it for my girls. And that was it. Like, I started writing it for my girls. And then for that person that was going through a challenge or a struggle, that they wanted a relatable book, not like, I was down on my luck and I climbed Mount Everest and now I'm speaking and saying like, look at me. I had like, I had no, no arms, no legs, no soul, no body, no nothing. And I climbed Mount Everest. Look at me. I had no tools and I did it. What are you guys in your corporate jobs mm-hmm. doing? And I wanted it to be relatable because I'm the guy in the grocery store behind, behind you in line. Yeah. And I think there's some wonderful, powerful stories that just, everyday heroes and sheroes. And I wanted it to be relatable to say, you know what? The definition of success isn't climbing Mount Everest. It may be for that person who's speaking to you, but the version of success that you can grab is just being the best version of who you can be. And I wanted to write it for that person. And then I decided if it was really about the message and not about making money, because the money piece didn't fuel me. It didn't feed me. I was like, I'm going to give all the proceeds away. Cool. And once I actually got that stuff out of my head, mm. then the book came easy. Then I was like, okay. Wow. And then I found an editor to help me because I didn't really know how to end it. So what I share in the book for the reader is that the journey from my last bad day, the day of the accident, through my recovery to the moment I get back on my bike again for that very first ride. And then in the last chapter, I give everyone, sort of written for my daughters, 20 ways of showing up, 20 ways of being, to move from human doer to human being. Because before my last bad day, I was living a life of like, sort of be, do, or do, have, be, right? Do, work really hard, have all the material stuff, like the title and the car and the bikes, and then I'll be happy. And I flipped the script, it was an old Zig Ziglar thing, that I was gonna sh- live my life in be, do, have. Be happy, do the things happy people do, and then you'll actually have more happiness. Yeah. And so the last chapter are 20 ways of being, and there's certainly more, but I share 20 ways of being that I learned along the way that can actually propel someone forward to their best version of who they can be, or as I like to say, complete success, having success on the outside, basically what your money can provide to you, but also having success on the inside, that, that peace and the joy and the happiness with, from within, and that's complete success to me. Um, so, and that's what the reader gets is that, that journey and it's not a how to, and it's not really a business book, but it is a mindset, you know, like that shift in mindset and looking at the world from scarcity, which I once looked at it as to more of abundance and really helping someone with a very, yeah, a very relatable story. Like you don't have to, don't get up caught up in the Tony Robbins And I only use Tony as because he's like an icon. But there's a lot of like, look at me. Like I, my business is like seven figures or eight figures, and yeah, like like I got all this stuff, and that's what success is. And I'm like, well, what about the bloke that wants to have a career that's like 250k? Yeah, and that's what their goal is. And they're like, well, I can't get to seven figures. Like, I actually, I don't want to get to seven figures because in order to get to seven figures or eight figures or whatever, you have to make different choices in your life. And someone may not want to make those choices. It's possible. And that's cool, right? I, I, think, I think we all have our own definition of success and we don't have to adopt someone else's. So my book is more about that, like, Find your goal, find your purpose, find your passion, find that all those great ingredients that make your stew awesome and just become that as opposed to you have to be here, here (laughs) or, you know, in order to be deemed successful in today's society. And we have, unfortunately, we do have a lot of that just 
because of social media because it makes it so easy to grab onto it. Yeah, of course. Wow, what a good message. Uh, one of our previous guests, Gareth Pickering, spoke about writing down what your ideal day looks like. And I think it's a really good exercise to do that because often you'll find it might not involve seven figures um, if you actually write it all out and you get down to what you really, really are wanting out of your life, you know. And um, I was wondering, do you have any, did you have any writing experience sort of before that? Had you, how, how did that come about? Because, I mean, it's done so well and uh, it's really well written and what have you by, the, by, by all accounts. So, um, yeah, how did, how did you get into the writing swing of things? So, again, Mr. 83% of me, like, like English class was not, like, if I got an 83 in English, we're saying something when I was in grammar school, and I rarely would get an 83. It would be something lower than that or less than that. So when I left corporate America, everyone was like, well, in order to get your name out there, you got to have to, you got to start blogging, right? The society wants you to put out a blog. So I started blogging and I was like, well, this is sort of fun. I actually, so I sort of did enjoy it. I was like, well, this is actually, I can be creative and not everyone was going to win a Pulitzer, but I was like, this is, this is fun. And I had all this writing. I had chicken scratch typing and I had it all out in notes, but what I was, I was missing the connective tissue and I knew like, I like this sort of story flow, the hero's journey, if you will. So I hired a really good editor. Like I, like I wanted a really good editor that really loved my story for my story and not about like, yeah. oh, this, I can make money off of this. Like I wanted someone to really understand like endurance sports, like cycling and running and like that aspect of one's life. So I hired a really good editor to help me sort of connect the pieces because I basically had all this writing, like journal entries. It was almost like a big puzzle, right? You, you take all the puzzle pieces out of the box and you put them on the table and some you can see and some you had to overturn to actually see the picture. But I had a whole bunch of that and I really struggled with putting it together. So Sally actually helped me put it together so I would write more. And then I I got really good, and this is a Sethism, like I got really good as to like who I was writing it for. Mm -hmm. Before I would write because it was about me. And then I was like, I'm gonna write for these people, my daughters and that person trying to go through a challenge or overcome a challenge. And so I made it less about me, actually not about me and just about them. And I kept on working at it. So it started, all started with my, my blog and you know, now I, I guess I am a writer, right? So, um, I, I am not guess I am a writer. <laughs> yeah. You have a book. Uh, but be, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I also, I realized that I have to, you know, I need some help. And I wanted to create a book that was aesthetically pleasing. Right? I wanted something that was like, since it was self-published, I wanted something that looked good. Sort of like all my handmade bikes. I wanted sort of the, the natural aspect of it, not like the mass-produced aspect of it. Mm -hmm. A little bit of that wabi-sabi feel. Like I wanted it to, you know, feel good and, and like and have it, you know, there would be some weight to it. So it, it meant something. And so I, I hired someone who was really creative and also was a expert editor. And so we formed a partnership to make that happen. So, but I had all this stuff and I just, yeah, I didn't fancy myself as a writer, but I knew, I knew that if I was going to get the story out for my girls, that I had to find the writer within me. And along the way, I, I found that person and, you know, and I, I don't know if there's another book in me. Uh, you know, it, it, it's one thing to write the book, to publicize and promote the book as a self-published work is a little bit harder than actually writing it from at least my perspective. But, you know, I wanted the book to be out there for the message. And the fact that we give all the proceeds to World Bicycle Relief and they help they help girls conquer the challenge of distance by giving them mobility means means a whole bunch to me because they they give them bi uh, bikes so they can stay in school. And when they stay in school long term, they have more economic independence and vitality. So the fact that my last bad day where I lost my mobility can be turned into like good days for people halfway around the world and and they give them mobility is like such for me, that's like such a great, great story. Yeah. And, you know, to be quite honest, like I've 
you know, one can say you've lost money on this book. And I don't look at it that way. Like I haven't made money. Right. So the, the, the whole experience I've had to, I've had to use my money to make it happen. Right. Cause I'm not gaining any profit from it, but I don't think I've lost anything. I've gained so much. Cause I know, sure. I know the stories I've gotten back. And if like my story can help one person avoid their SUV, then the whole experience is worth it. Actually, mm -hmm. after my daughters read it and they're like, they gave me a hug and they said they loved it. And like, you know, it's hard for me to even to share it without like starting to get choked up. And like, then I was like, all right, this project, thumbs up. Yeah. Seth actually yeah. asked me, so I sent my my marketing plan. I look at it now, like the marketing plan I sent to Seth was so, it's so embarrassing. <laughs> like, it was like, it was just, there were typos in it. Like, I like, how would you send this to Seth? There's like, I, I feel like such a schmo for sending it to him, <laughs> but back and forth on Slack, he was like, well, how many books do you want to sell? I go, I want to sell three, uh, one to each daughter and one to someone who needs <laughs> the book. He goes, that's a really good goal. You know? Right. And, and he did it. He did it in Seth way. He didn't say like, well, the book sucks and you're only going to sell three copies. He did it in a very like, you know, like book world way to, you know, sell it to three people and those three people or he has that power of 10 those 10 people will tell 10 people who tell 10 people um but yeah for me it was a real push outside of my comfort zone to go from where i was in seventh grade english to now a writer of a best-selling memoir and for it to change people's lives across the planet i'm like holy cow like you know when you're looking for like why did this happen to me this whole last bad day. Well, here's one reason why it, it happened to me mm. is there was a book inside and that one book, you know, one story could mean something really meaningful to someone else. And maybe that's why I lived, or maybe the Jeez. full reason is still, you know, is still coming. Right. Because I, I believe that like my last step, my last pedal stroke on this planet is going to be my best one. Like, I don't believe that we're peaking at 45 or 50. All the people out there are like, oh, I'm, I'm like 45 and like I'm peaked. And I'm like, like, they're looking forward to retirement. I'm like, what the heck is up with that? Like, you're at halftime, dude. <laughs> yeah. Like, we got another like hopefully 45 more years on this planet. And you know what? That last step I take on this planet is going to be my best damn step. Because awesome. I'm gonna continue to grow, and I'm like that was my mantra in my recovery: like work hard today to make tomorrow better, and wake up the next day, work hard today to make tomorrow better. And that's how I came up with my little tagline and my my company of creating better tomorrows. Like I always like working on cre working hard today to make a better tomorrow, and yes. that's just that's now how I live my life. But yeah, if my story can. As I mentioned earlier, if my story can help someone miss that SUV that's about to barrel into them, then all this, all this is worth it. Yeah, what I was saying. There's a term. There's a term you used earlier: uh, connective tissue with your all your fragmented information over the years. And you know, sitting here talking with the two of you guys, um, I, it made me think of that term, like you know, the connective tissue of of life, you, you don't know how something in your life's gonna connect you to something else. Uh, and and here we are, I'm like feeling super inspired by what you're saying and uh, and all because of that and that's some kind of that weird connective tissue between our, our lives that happens because of random, seemingly random events, you know, so um, it's a really cool sort of term to, to remember. No, I, yeah, I love it. It's sort of like the, the cartilage or like, you know, you have your ligaments and your bones and, but inside your body, there's all this connective tissue that sort of all mm. keeps it together. And that's what I think, you know, the, the cool thing again about social media is it can bring, it can connect more people together. As we mentioned up front, mm. like the all NBA, yeah, Gareth, we have that in common, but then it was also like, I found Faye's podcast. Yeah. And I listened, she posted something on Facebook about one of her interviews. I listened, I was like, oh yeah, Faye. Like, I remember her posting something about like a podcasting group. And then we got talking and then through the podcasting group, we met. It was like these like little things yeah. that before my last bad day, I would have probably blown right past them. Yeah. 
and now trying to live my life and just trying to be more present, like I can pick up on that. Be like, oh, that's really cool. Mm. Let's pull that thread. Like what's behind Faye's door? What's behind Faye's world? Right. That's the name of her podcast. (laughs) Uh, She's really awesome. And then I like with that, like I met Gareth and a whole bunch of other awesome people. And then, you know, we're connecting and we're connecting like you got like we're it's this is an international Skype. Yeah, exactly. And recording. And like how cool is that? Right. As yeah. we started talking <laughs> earlier about like how how we're living at a time that's like really special and how life is changing so radically. And we like to fixate on the things that we don't like that are changing radically, but there's a a wealth of wonder that's changing changing life for the good, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Sure. Yeah. And geez, I mean, now just listening to that about you touching people. And I think there's, there's so many people that you have touched already and so many people that you are going to touch. And you're also never going to know like so many of the people that you do touch and you do help, you know, especially with the charity and the money you're giving that, you know, you're giving to the charity, like, and that's the wonderful thing, you know, you, and that's going to just sort of carry on and you are really almost changing people's life completely by doing that, um, which is just such an amazing thing that you're doing. So, you know, we really, really love that. And we're, we're super conscious of time and, uh, you know, there's, there's a million things we obviously could, uh, go through and, and speak to you about still. And, uh, but, but just, if you just want to kind of briefly, just uh let people know like you know what you're currently up to um just like you know in in a couple of minutes and also how to get hold of you um so you know they can touch base and and just get in touch if they'd like to yeah thanks for that opportunity gareth to share so the best way for people to reach me is to go to my website which is michaelobrienshift.com there you can contact me there. The phone number is there. All my social media platform stuff is all there. You can sign up for my blog and my re- take my resilience quiz, all that jazz. And then what I do, like when I'm not speaking or like not trying to push my book out through Amazon, because you can they can get the book through Amazon.com and Barnes and Noble, and they, there's an e version of it. So for everyone that's international, where Amazon doesn't ship to, they can get the ebook. But my day-to-day life is trying to help leaders lead better. So I work with sales and marketing professionals, entrepreneurs who want to show up differently. They want to sort of slay their their negative stories, just like I had like my story before my last bad day. And they've reached a certain level in their organization and they want to do the job well and they want to keep their job. And they really want to realize complete success. So they may have all the markers of external success, but they're not successful on the inside. So I help them lead better and almost try to reach, you know, reach that former executive just like I was. And most people work with me because they realize that I've been in the trenches and I speak their language. So that's traditionally like what my business is all about. Peloton coaching, and so Peloton is my metaphor for a tribe at work, right? It's a group of cyclists, um, and so that's obviously a play on my whole cycling story. And then I have something new coming up that I'm going to launch in July, and it's really geared toward those those folks that report into the people I do one-on-one coaching on. So the one-on-one coaching clients are typically like executive directors to chief operating officers. But there are a whole bunch of managers and directors who are really thirsty to grow and they don't have access to a company sponsored executive coach. So through a membership uh, program that I'm calling a pace, the pace line, which is another cycling analogy that they get access to a lot of great growth and development uh, wisdom. My experience as a former executive now as a coach and then my, my cycling accident recovery journey and so I'm going to launch that in July, which is going to be really cool. So people can be on the lookout for that. So all, all to help them. And they actually, through the program, can get access to one-on-one coaching. All for something very reasonable as far as a price. It's a lot less than what they normally um, give to Starbucks every month. So uh, <laughs> uh, more, more on that to come as we get closer to July 1st. Cool. Nice. Yeah. Well, well, Michael, let me just say from from the two of us and obviously myself, it's uh, been a real, real pleasure listening to you. Uh, I would most certainly uh, 
be one of those people who'd love to be on on a coaching call with you. You know, because you're very relatable. Uh, you speak really well, uh, and uh, it's, it, like I said, it's, it's just a real pleasure to to actually hear you speak. Uh, and uh, so, so thank you for that, and thank you for sharing your story so openly with us because I really do think um, it's a story of, you know, we spoke about vanilla and I think vanilla is still the, the bell curve. There's most of us live a sort of a normal-ish life and, and we can still do exciting, interesting things and still help people, others in so many amazing ways, even though our life might seem pretty average, a lot of it, a lot of it you know, and and I think that's a really, really insta- inspiring story, like to see how far you've come uh, and all the exciting things that you're busy, busy with. So thanks for sharing that that journey with us um, and, and giving us so much hope and inspiration. And we really are looking forward to to seeing how that all pans out in the future. And I, I look forward to reading your, your memoirs as well. So, so thanks for your time tonight. No problem. Thanks, guys. It was awesome to be on with you. It was a great conversation. A great way for me to end the week. So this is a great capstone. So thank you again. Uh, cool. And then Michael, just from me as well, like it's so nice like to just meet somebody like, you know, like we have through the LTMBA and now we're, we're doing a podcast together. And I just feel like this is like the beginning of a, a great new friendship. And even like hearing your story has kind of like deepen my friendship with you in like a I don't know if it's a strange way but like I you know I really admire you as a human and you know like I just love how you've really pivoted I guess on your life based on a really uh, horrible situation you know uh, or incident uh, from your from your accident and and I'm you know like in a strange way I want to say like I'm really glad that that happened because you you this you this flipping amazing motivational inspirational guy who clearly has a heart of gold and just wants to help other people uh, realize like the goodness in them as well and that's so cool and even more importantly the the, the best thing is that you're so genuine and that you you deeply love your your wife and your kids and that's the best thing and the most important thing of everything um and we're super excited for you like yes uh, there, there's you know there's so much going on for you in the future like and uh, we really look forward to kind of uh following you and tracking how that goes uh and actually i know we mentioned it uh you know just over email but craig and i are going to be in new york in july and if we can somehow hook up a coffee and take you for a coffee and that would be just awesome Mm. um to kind of you just meet you in person and then sort of give you a big hug and handshake and whatnot and yeah <laughs> and that uh, would be awesome no, yeah, i yeah. love it so so yeah just a big thank you from us we we put together a whole lot of show notes as well so all your contact details and everything will be in there too and we just we're really rooting for you and thank you so much for for all your time on this uh, friday morning no no problem guys thank you and definitely when you guys come to new york in july we will hook up have hugs, coffees, scones, what have you. Great. So, uh, Sounds, good. Thanks, uh, Sounds good. Thanks again for having me and have a beautiful weekend. Cool, and thanks a lot. Bud. Cheers. Sleep time, man. Cool.